my name is Adam Winrich and this is a video about the physics of a whip crack. The three things I hope to accomplish in this video are explain a little bit of history about the whip, I'm going to go through a spiel of physics formulas that I do in my show at Renaissance festivals, and then I'll also try to describe how those formulas relate to the crack of the whip or not. That's something I don't do in my show because it's too long and boring. And then finally, I would like to attempt to describe why it's so difficult to create a true faithful mathematical model of a whip. Now, this video was inspired by a lunch I had this past winter with my physics professor from college, Matt Evans. I graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Eau Claire with a double major in math and physics. I don't do a whole lot with physics anymore, but I did try to keep up with uh, some of the science about the crack of a whip. And this video is more geared towards other uh, physics professors and science teachers who might want to use a whip as a demonstration of a sonic boom in the classroom. So first, let me just say what the basics of a sonic boom are. So a sonic boom is something going faster than the speed of sound, going so fast, it actually creates a vacuum in the air. And then that slapping sound you hear is the air banging against itself. Now we don't often think about the pressure of the air that we are surrounded with and how high that column of air goes up. But that's the sound you hear is the air we are surrounded by bang, slapping back against itself once something goes through it breaking the sound barrier. That's the same sound you hear as thunder after a lightning strike. A vacuum is formed and the thunder is the air slapping back against itself. Now a little bit of history of the whip. The whip is the oldest man-made object to break the sound barrier. Uh, Anthony DeLong just says that it goes back to 3000 BC in the ancient Chinese and Egyptian cultures. Back in Egypt, it was used as a symbol of power and authority. You can often see depictions of the pharaoh holding a whip in one hand as a symbol of his power and authority. Also in China, they initially were used for herding animals, moving cows, horses, sheep, as you would usually think that a whip would be used for. And then later, whips were adopted by their martial artists, and now it is a standard feature in Kung Fu martial arts in China. That's a little bit of a history of the whip. Uh, here's my little joke about it that I do in my show. So uh, a <clears throat> whip crack is the oldest man-made object to break the sound barrier. And for thousands of years, mankind has used the crack of a whip to drive chariots, tame wild animals, and even scare away evil demons. And that's why I never see my ex-girlfriend. Uh, that's, that's the joke, yuck, yuck. Now to some more material that I do in my show that is uh, slightly well rehearsed. So a whip crack is a sonic boom, the end of the whip going faster than the speed of sound. That has been proven by physics. Now speed of sound is about 768 miles per hour, but the end of a whip can go upwards of 950 miles per hour, breaking the sound barrier. That has been proven by physics, and a few principles of physics related to the crack of the whip include conservation of kinetic energy, conservation of angular momentum, centripetal force, and waves propagate through strings. Of course, kinetic energy equals one half the mass times the velocity squared. Angular momentum is equal to the product of a body's moment inertia with angular velocity. Centripetal force equals mass times the velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature of the speed of wave propagating through a string is directly proportional to the square root of the tension divided by linear mass density. As that hip hop, a hippie, a hippie to the hip hip hop. You don't stop the rocket to the bang bang boogie so up jump the boogie to the rhythm of the boogie the beat now, i wasn't trying to confuse anyone i was just trying to be as smart as a whip maybe i should have said all of those physics formulas more slowly so that way you didn't get a whiplash and i'm sure if i say one more whip pun you guys are going to snap that's right all of those puns will go over great in any classroom now let's break it on down. How do those formulas apply or not to the crack of a whip? So first, kinetic energy, conservation of kinetic energy. So kinetic energy equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared. The idea is, is that if we have a whole system moving, as long as it's not acted on by some outside force, the kinetic energy will be conserved. So when I go to do a whip crack called the flick, I'm gonna start back here and I'm gonna move my hand from this point to this point at a pretty slow velocity, but the whole body of the whip is moving. So I essentially have a very low velocity, but I have a large mass moving. And that number, whatever it might be, has to be conserved. So once I throw the whip out and I stop my hand, what, I, what actually happens is that the part of the whip that continues to move gets smaller and smaller and smaller as the wave rolls out. This part's not moving anymore. 
the part that is moving gets smaller and smaller and smaller. The mass decreases, goes down, 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 till finally we get to the very end where, the, where it's only this little bit of mass right here that is going to crack. So since, and it's also only this little bit of mass that actually is still moving. And because we have a little bit of mass, we have to have a huge velocity. So at the start of the motion, we had a big mass going very slowly, and then we end with a little mass going very, very quickly. And if I threw the whip out correctly, it's so fast, it goes faster than the speed of sound. So that's conservation of kinetic energy. I think that's the easiest one to apply to the crack of a whip. And now let's talk about angular momentum. The only reason I throw in angular momentum is because it was in an old tape that I had as a kid called The Art of the Bull Whip. You can still buy it on DVD uh, from westernstageprops.com. And in there, uh, they do all sorts of stuff about the whip. They actually go to a professor at a university and he tries to describe why a whip cracks. And he says angular momentum. And the example they use is the classic one of a figure skater spinning. If they have their arms out, they're gonna spin slowly. And then when they pull their arms in, they spin very quickly. Arms out means you have a, a very big moment of inertia or a big resistance to turning. And then arms in means you have a very small resistance to turning. So that means when you start out here, you have to have a slow velocity, but you pull your arms in and you make the, the moment of inertia go down, the angular velocity or how fast you're spinning boom, has to go up. And the only reason I can think why they wanted to apply this to the crack of a whip is because they, I think they thought that when you throw the whip out, you start out with a really big loop like this, a really big wave, and then as you go down, right before the whip cracks, there must be a really small wave, just like you start out with the arms out and then end with arms in. However, I really, in anything I've seen with a whip crack, the waveform doesn't start out that big and it doesn't end that small. So I don't think conservation of angular momentum really applies to the crack of a whip. And now let's talk about, let's see, centripetal force. Centripetal force is mass times velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature. Centripetal force is uh, basically what you feel if you're in the car and you go around a curve, or if you're in a roller coaster and you go in a really steep curve and you feel your butt mm, push down in the seat. <clears throat> Excuse me, your body wants to keep going straight, but the car keeps you going along in the curve and applies a force against your body. So I think it's the radius of curvature that's actually very important to the whip because as you can see, when the whip rolls out, there is definitely sort of a, a radius of curvature here. And also, if you've ever tried to crack a whip, you know there are thousands of ways to not get a whip to crack. And if you only look at it from the perspective of conservation of kinetic energy, you would think, I just gotta throw that whip out and conservation of kinetic energy will take care of the rest. But actually you have to throw the whip out with enough skill, so that way at the end of the whip's motion, we have sort of a, a, a small enough radius of curvature, a tight enough radius of curvature to get the whip to crack. Because when the whip cracks, where it cracks, it does not crack when the whip is fully extended. It actually cracks right about here when the whip starts going through a curve at the end of its motion. Right when it starts going through the curve, that's when we see the shock waves sort of thrown off of the whip. And if this radius of curvature here isn't tight enough and isn't enough in line with itself, then the whip won't crack. So we see that in that centripetal force, mass times velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature. We have a small enough radius of curvature on the bottom. That means the velocity has to be pretty high. So that's centripetal force. And uh, finally, the last formula I'll talk about is the speed of a wave propagating through a string is directly proportional to the square root of the tension divided by the linear mass density. Now really, this only applies to something like guitar strings where they uh, have a are fixed on both ends and there's tension in it with the whip. I'm only hanging on to one end. That other end of the whip is totally free to move in an infinite number of ways. So that means this formula doesn't directly apply, but it is interesting to think of that speed of the wave as uh, we have linear mass density on the bottom. So first, what linear mass density means is basically just how much weight is there per unit length of whip. How much weight do I have in this foot of the whip versus this one, this one. As you can see, it keeps going down and down and down till finally we have a very small linear mass density right here at the end. It's very light compared to what we started out with at the beginning of the whip. So because the uh, linear mass density is kind of on the bottom of that equation, that means as the linear mass density, linear mass density goes down, the speed of the wave, boom, has to go up. 
So that is how we can think of the tapering of whip, making it easier for the whipped crack for that speed of the wave propagating down the whip to go faster and result in a sonic boom. And to follow up with that, some of the things that do make it actually difficult to come up with a real faithful model with the crack of a whip. First is, as I said before, like guitar strings have complete, are fixed on both ends. They have a lot of tension with the whip. Uh, it's free to move in an infinite number of ways. Uh, it's really tough to measure, measure any kind of tension or force in the whip. So that makes it difficult to model. Also, it's very difficult to create a solid uh, mathematical approximation of the taper of the whip as it's moving. And also, it's difficult to come up with a model that approximates this sort of rolling loop as the whip rolls down. For example, in the Journal of the Acoustical Society of America, in their article about a whip crack, which came out about 70 years ago, they actually came up with a model, a group of different equations to model a whip, but instead of having a waveform like this coming down the whip, they just boom, smushed it completely flat, so that way you had one non-moving part of the whip and the moving part of the whip kept getting smaller, but there was no like wave form right in there, just boom, smushed flat. That's a little bit about the difficulty of trying to create a good mathematical model for a whip crack. Well, that's the end of my understanding of the physics of a whip crack. If I got any of that wrong, by all means, make a reply video or write it down in the comments. I will read all of them. I'm all ears. In fact, I'm going to send this video to my physics professors and they will let me know if I got it wrong. Anyway. And uh, also, uh, for anyone out there that would like to continue their support of my YouTube channel, I do have a Patreon. I'll put a link in the description. You can support my Patreon for as little as a dollar a month. I appreciate all the support I get. And again, my name is Adam Winrich. Thanks for watching.